So today's workshop is going to be covering product post launch steps. So this is kind of building on last week's workshop, which was how to launch your product. And we're just going to be talking about the steps you can take that set yourself up for success once you've launched your product and released it to the public. So as always, the check-in code is post product, and you can check in at acmucsd.com. So great, you've launched your product, now what? Um, the first thing I wanna focus on is a quote that's promoted by Y Combinator. And if you don't know what, what Y Combinator is, it's a startup accelerator that's worked with plenty of startups. It's really successful. Um, and some of the companies I've worked with include DoorDash, Airbnb, Stripe, and so on. And what they like to say is you gotta do things that don't scale. So this is sort of a different mentality than what's promoted like traditionally in the business world and in school. Um, a lot of people focus on scaling and focus on traditional techniques. But I like this quote and the reason why why Combinator likes this quote is because it promotes people to be more creative. Um, as you can imagine, there are plenty like there are a lot of startups in the world, but we don't hear about like most of them. It's really hard for startups to do well and the ones that do do well distinguish themselves by doing creative and unique things. So if you do things that don't scale, it is really the only way to grow when you're small. So the first piece of content I wanted to cover for today is product market fit. And once you've released a product and you're a startup, you should be asking yourself, do you have a product market fit? And in case you don't know what that is, it's simply defined as finding a good market with a product capable of satisfying that market. So in order to tell if you have a product market fit, the best way to do so is to use data. And using data will help you understand if you've made something that people want. When it comes to using data and when it comes to this data that I'm talking about, um, there are two parts that you need to understand. The first one being figuring out the data point or metric that represents the value of your company. And that'll change from company to company, what service or product they're providing. But that's one of the things that you need to figure out. And then the other one being know how often you should be doing that. So these two things, I'm going to analyze a couple of real world like examples and showing you like how those companies have a product market fit and what are the two things that they have that shows that. So the first example I wanted to talk about was Instagram. So their data point or metric is coming back onto the app. So with Instagram, as we know, there's so many different things you can do on it. You can post, you can chat, you can comment. Um, but Instagram really doesn't care about what you do on their app. They just want you to be on their app in general and to return to it often. So if we're talking about how often that this data point or metric should be happening, they want you coming back nearly every day just to check in, scroll a little, a little bit. You don't have to be posting. They just want you to continually use their app um, so you can extend what you do every day on there. Um, another example is Airbnb. So with Airbnb, the main data point at metric that they're looking at is bookings and stays. A lot of people on Airbnb tend to browse and like do a lot of searches so that they can pair it, they can compare it with hotels and other platforms, but Airbnb doesn't really care about all those people that are just browsing. They really just care about bookings and stays and people that are actively using their product. Um, when it comes to that data point or metric, they are looking at it annually because travel is often an annual thing. Obviously, there's a lot of people that use Airbnb every few months for different reasons, but it's better to look at things annually for people that use, for the a lot of people that use Airbnb for vacations and traveling in general. Um, and then lastly, Lyft. So Lyft, the main data point and metric is riders, the amount of riders that they have. Again, they could be looking at other data points and metrics, but those aren't as important. Like if they looked at how many drivers they have or how many miles they've driven people in like a certain period of time, but they're really just looking at riders, how many people have the app and are actively using it. And how often is weekly or monthly just looking at the numbers for every week, how many writers they have, or every month, how many writers do they have? Um, and then when you figure out whether or not you have a product market fit, it's also important to consider and to measure repeat usage. 
So this is the best unbiased way to see if someone is actually liking your product. And this kind of goes along with retention, whether or not your product or service is retaining the people that join from the start, and if it's even increasing the number of users that it has. And this is really important to understand for when you talk to investors, because as you can imagine, there are plenty of products and services that released a product into the market, and then a lot of people join in the beginning, and then like 50% of them leave after a week or something like that. Obviously, even if you have a lot of people join from the start, if you don't retain those users, if you don't have repeat usage, then there is no value in your product or service. And you obviously didn't see if you had a product market fit to begin with. Um, so if you look at this graph here, if you don't have a product market fit, again, product market fit is just defined as whether or not people have value for your service or product. So if you don't have it, then the amount of users that are returning would decrease by a lot. But if you do have product market fit, then it's natural for you not to retain a lot of like users, but it wouldn't decrease as much. And then um, kind of going off on that, there are other like data points, metrics, and things that you could be looking at as a startup once you release your product. But we found that, you know, these three things aren't as helpful and I'll kind of go into why. So while surveys are good to see like how to improve specific features of your product and get feedback from your users, which is which all of that is important. Um, it's not a good way to see whether or not people actually like your product and are actually using it because of bias. Um, everyone that's responding or, or not everyone would respond to your surveys. It's not like a piece of data that says like I have like 20 riders or like users. Instead, it's just showing like people that opted into like actually taking the time to respond to your survey and then like how they respond to your survey and the questions that are on the survey will also impact things. Um, another thing that you shouldn't really be looking at is registered users. Um, that says nothing really about repeat usage. You can have a lot of registered users, but none of them are actually using it. So like earlier I was talking about Lyft and they had riders. Um, that's not just people with accounts on Lyft. That's people that are actively um, booking cars and um, using the app. And then lastly, visitors, this is kind of similar to like registered users. If you have visitors like visiting your webpage or something, that doesn't really say much about the value of your product and who's actually using it and whether or not they enjoy or like your product. That just shows people are just like maybe interested or just like glancing at it. So now that you have a product market fit, what do you do? And I'm gonna be going into experimentation and growth. So the, one of the two post-launch focuses would be product growth. So product growth is something that the engineers, designers, data scientists, developers work on. And what they're working on is improving specific parts of your product. So now you've released it to the public and obviously whatever you release isn't perfect. It, it shouldn't be perfect. And there are probably a bunch of bugs and things that, they, they, that can be improved on. So that's what product growth is. It's just improving what you've already released. And as you can see in this graph, um, I'm sure you can find it online, just a regular product life cycle graph. Once you have an introduction, like things are starting out slow. Um, and then you have a period of growth where you're working on the product and you're also working on getting like people to use your product, like marketing that. And then you have sort of like a maturity point where you've reached your peak, where you have like a lot of people. And from there, it can either decline or you can have product extension, which is like continuing, continuing to do product growth and like developing your product that can extend it longer. Um, so there's a question in chat. Would adding new features be considered part of product growth as well? Yeah. So adding fe new features would definitely be considered part of product growth. It's not just like fixing bugs and stuff that's already out there. Um, yeah, just anything that improves the existing product that you already released. So going on to like other focuses after releasing your product, one of them should be growth channels. So growth channels are just other platforms besides your app or website that you are like talking about your um, 
your product on and sort of promoting it. And these are platforms that people tend to discover products on. And it's not just limited to like social media or just like search engines or whatever. There are plenty of other platforms that people use in order to grow what they have. And I'll go be going, I'll be going into that on the next slide. Um, but just keep in mind that there are a different set of metrics per platform. So for each platform, there are different things that you could be looking at. And you shouldn't really focus on every platform because that's not strategic. You should fo focus on a platform that you think will benefit you the most and then be looking at the specific set of metrics for that specific platform. So to kind of help you understand what growth channels are, um, this graphic shows two of the most popular scaled growth channel for consumer unicorns. Um, and unicorns, by the way, are startups that have uh, valuations of over a billion dollars. So uh, the first growth channel is SEO, which is search engine optimization. So getting your web page to get to the top of like um, a search if you search for something. And I'm sure, or I don't know if everyone's seen this, but I know I have. If I look something up, um, I often see like Pinterest links at the top and I didn't really have Pinterest before and I didn't really know what it was, but it was always showing up at the top of my page. So obviously they were using search empty search engine optimization as their growth channel and it worked out well for them as well as these other companies. Um, but another channel that doesn't really relate to like social media or like, like something online is referrals. And that's just when you like companies reward existing users for referring that product to another person. Like you can get, you can like share a code or something and you'll get like a free ride or like 20% off or something like that. And a lot of these companies are familiar because so many of them use referrals. And I'm sure many of you have used referrals on there or like people have shared referrals with you. So these are two growth channels that are really successful and people tend to use. Um, and then some more questions. Uh, so many referrals, always seeing companies do that. Yeah, I especially see that a lot with DoorDash and Uber and Lyft. Um, and it's as like a user myself, it's really hard to like not say no to those referrals because if people are going to end up using it anyways, you might as well benefit from it by sending it to them. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good growth channel. Um, another thing people focus on that kind of goes along with growth channels is conversion rate optimization. So to kind of give some context to this, every step of the product experience can be measured. And when you're measuring every step of the product experience, you're trying to figure out what people are doing with your product. So for example, if you had a website, you can measure how many people are visiting each page of my website daily. And then what you're gonna do is since you're trying to figure out what people are doing with the product, you're gonna see, okay, well, if everyone's landing on the home page, how many of them are going to this page or how many of them are going from like here to here? And you can kind of track the flow of people and seeing where they drop off, like where, what things aren't they going to and just getting a general understanding of how they're using your product or service. And the reason why it's important to optimize like your conversion rate and improve upon it is because it improves the product experience and that's something that you want to do after you release your product. Uh, there are different ways to improve conversion rate optimization. Um, these are just three of them, but the first one being internationalization. So if you do have a website, um, international, internationalization would be like translating your website or just making it more accessible to different people than you originally created it for. And another one would be authentication. So let's say you have an online service and people need to sign in and create an account. If your authentication process is not seamless, if it's, if it's slow or if it's just sort of annoying to go through, then people will easily just drop off and not wanna create an account and not wanna use your product. And then lastly, purchase conversion. So everything that surrounds itself with like making a purchase um, on your platform is really important, like arranging from the designs to the flow. And if any of that like discourages people from wanting to make a purchase, then that's obviously bad. So that's something that you can improve upon. Um, so now that we've talked about like product market fit, whether or not you have it, and then also like what steps you can take to grow your product and improve upon it. Uh, I wanted to talk about looking into the future and setting goals and KPIs and these two things kind of 
help focus, like help focus your efforts while you're doing all those other things. These things help guide your way. So KPIs are key performance indicators. And what those are is a set of quantitative metrics that indicate how healthy your business is doing. So setting the right KPIs and goals will objectively tell you if you're doing well, just okay, or bad. Um, and when I say the right KPIs and goals, obviously, if you're setting KPIs and goals that aren't related to your company or, or like not related to your product, or if they're too small of goals or KPIs, like something that you can easily achieve, then that's not enough to help guide you in the long run. And then that also doesn't give you like any important information because whether or not you achieved it won't show whether or not like your company is doing well. Um, and kind of going along with that growth rate and metrics. So this is something that you want to track and set goals upon. Um, growth rate um, should be set in terms of your primary metrics. So growth rate is just like, like a number that you look at to see like how much something is growing and that something is your primary metric. Um, and your primary metric is the main thing to see performance. Um, so for example, like if your primary metric is number of people booking rides every day then your growth rate would be like oh i want that to increase by like 10 percent at this week or and so on and with a growth rate you want to be setting a weekly growth rate as a startup because startups need frequent feedback and every week should be something new there should be something happening it shouldn't really be that slow because you don't have a lot of time as a startup and if you also divide things into like a weekly growth rate and track it then this helps divide progress into doable chunks. And I'll kind of be talking about that in a couple slides. Um, kind of shifting gears here into goals and how you can make goals. Um, the first thing that you need to think of is thinking for yourself. Define the goal based on yourself and not what others are doing. Even if there's like startups, companies, and products that are similar to what you have, you shouldn't be basing your goals on them and what they're doing. Um, because you need to really just ground yourself and understand where you are today. And one thing to keep in mind is that these goals should be ambitious and achievable, uh, achievable based on your product. So while you should be reaching for something that's like, like hard to do and, and, and can be far away, it shouldn't be too far away and it shouldn't be too easy. Um, kind of like what I was talking about earlier with, you know, KPIs and goals. And here are some guidelines that to keep in mind of when you're setting goals. Um, the first thing is you should consider time to sell. So time to sell is the amount of time it takes for you to like sell something, like sell your product or the amount of time it takes for a customer to purchase something. And you need to consider that when making your goals because this is a number, like a period of time that should be decreasing over time. It shouldn't be getting harder or taking longer for people to do that. And then you should also be considering organic users and growth. Um, paid users and growth is sort of cheating the system. It's not an accurate like depiction of how you're doing. So keeping track of organic users and growth and setting goals upon that um, will definitely help guide you. And then lastly, uh, the last thing you should consider is setting exponential goals. So since you are a startup, um, your goals shouldn't really be linear because Startups have a lot of like room to work with and have a lot, like a long way to go. So your goals should definitely be exponential and um, big, but obviously it's gonna start off small and grow after that. So kind of combining goals and growth rate, um, there are two ways that you can pick goals. The first one being just picking a growth rate. And when you pick a growth rate, make sure it's something that you can actually hit. And if you don't hit it, then obviously you need to change something, not the growth rate per se, but you need to change something that you're doing with the startup and with your product. And if you're consistently hitting that growth rate, then that should be a sign that you need to raise it. So picking that growth rate and pitching, uh, picking that primary metric and sticking to it is one way to go with. And then the second one is called time box absolute goal. And what this is, is you're kind of thinking of things like absolutely, like you're kind of thinking of things in like a larger scale, but then breaking it up afterwards. So what you're going to do is think about what you want at the end of a certain period of time. So for example, um, what would the, 
what would the number of riders I have look like after 10 weeks? So that's sort of the absolute goal. That's like the larger scale thing. And then you're going to have to time box it and breaking up, break it up into different periods. So you go back out and look at weekly growth rates. And that way you figure out what numbers, what things you need per week. And then that'll help you figure out how to accomplish the larger goal that you made. So why are these steps important? Um, metrics and goals don't mean anything if you don't leverage them. As I said, um, after talking about like product market fit, metrics and goals help keep you focused and help you help make sure that when you're doing like product growth and going into growth channels, you have something guiding you. And that's why you should use them as a motivational goal. Um, a cool example would be Airbnb. What they did was, as I was talking about earlier with like growth rate, they printed a graph of what growth they wanted in 10 weeks. And then they just like taped it everywhere in the office, all over the desks, all over the walls, just a constant reminder of what they wanted to achieve. And then obviously if they weren't hitting those, if they weren't hitting that growth rate and if they weren't hitting those numbers, then that would spark discussion and work and meetings and make sure that it's just something that helped keep them aligned. Um, that's actually everything I have for today's workshop. Um, thank you for attending. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute or just send it in the chat. But yeah, thanks for coming.